Welcome everyone to 70 Faces. We are doing three chapters tonight. Three chapters with the goal, as I mentioned, we are going to finish in just two more weeks, next Sunday, and then two weeks after. We'll be able to finish all 70 Faces. So tonight we're gonna to begin with chapter 63. <laughs> which is the whole last section is about numbers, as I think we all know by this point. And here it's measurements and numbers of items in different places. Measurements are very, very significant and numbers of people or items is also very important. Usually we just do one or two chapters, but because we're doing three chapters, uh, we'll go a little bit quicker and try to get enough examples from each of the chapters. So for those who have the book, our first example is on page 609, the bottom one. And when we're talking about measurements and significance and symbolism, so the main place where we see this, certainly not the only, but the main place we see this is in the Mishkan, in the tabernacle, where every measurement, every color, every size, every type of material, every type of metal is all highly significant. So there are, really scores of measurements within the tabernacle. We'll be dealing with a few of them. And so the first one is that around, we'll call the courtyard, there were um, uh, curtains. And also in the inner sanctuary, between the boards, there were curtains. Remember, this was a movable, adaptable Mishkan. Later, the temple in Jerusalem follows the same prototype, but of course is a, was meant to be a permanent building. As we know, both temples were destroyed, but still it was built in a sense to, to, to last. So in the Mishkan itself, there were 10 curtains. This is not the courtyard. This is in the, um, the inner sanctum where the Holy of Holies was and the menorah and the table of the showbread, the table of the incense, the altar, no, the altar was outside, excuse me, was in the inner sanctuary. And of course the ark. And so the Torah commands in Shemot, Exodus uh, chapter 26, verses one through six. This tells about the curtains and how they are to be uh, connected together. And the idea was that on each hem of five curtains were put together and another five curtains, but then you had to connect those two groupings in order to put the, the Mishkan together. And so on each side, there were 50 loops and then 50 golden clasps connected them. And in this explanation of these 50 loops, it says that the, uh, I'll just read it. It says 50 loops you shall make on the first curtain and 50 loops you shall make on the end of the curtain that is on the second set. The loops shall correspond to one another. So here the word for correspond one to another is makbilot halulaot. That the loops should correspond one with the other. The way we can imagine this is, let's say you someone buttons their, their uh, blouse or their shirt but they don't get the button in the right loop, right? Sometimes we dress very quickly in the morning. If we're lucky, we notice it before we walk out the house. 
Other times it's not corresponding exactly. So the Torah says, make sure that the 50 loops are connected in, in a corresponding level. But the, the, the importance here is that the word, Avram just posted it in Hebrew, is that the, the loop shall be makbilot. The root word of, of that is kabel. Kabel, usually we think of meaning the root of to receive. And of course, it's the root of Kabbalah. Rav Ginsburg points out that in the whole Torah, the root, kuf bet lamed, meaning to receive, only appears here and not in the context of receiving, in the context of making correct correspondences. So Rav Ginsburg says a very simple but very profound idea of the purpose of Kabbalah. It says the purpose of Kabbalah is the, the art, is the consciousness of being able to see the correspondences between everything. At the end of the section about these curtains, it says, when you put them together, and now you have the space of the sanctuary, it says, and the Mishkan will be one. So Rav Ginsburg says that is the purpose of Kabbalah, to see how everything corresponds one to another. And ultimately, it's Hashem Echad. Everything is a part of the oneness of, of God as it appears and manifests in the world. So this is just a beautiful understanding of what Kabbalah is based on the idea of these 50 loops. Now, some commentaries point out, as we said, every measurement is, is important, that the 50 loops represent the 50 uh, gates of understanding. Hamishim Sharei Bina, the 50 gates of understanding. And that is the symbolism of these 50 loops. So that is our first example. The next one also has to do with the Mishkan, and this time with the menorah, the seven branch candle Abram. And this is on the bottom of page 611. And so the verse says in English, and this was the form of the menorah, hammered work of gold from its base to its flower, it was hammered work. According to the form God had shown Moshe, so did he construct the menorah. So the Balaturim points out that the beginning of the sentence, and this was the form, and this, the zot, is gematria 18. And the Balaturim points out that the menorah stood exactly 18 tefachim. This is a tefach, a, a fist. This is a tefach. And the menorah was 18 tefachim high. And it's, the, the hint to it is in this word, vizot. Now, we know that high 18 equals life. And sometimes the menorah is compared to the tree of life. The, the, the spherot are also called the tree of life, but the menorah especially represents the tree of life as does the Torah that was in the ark. So that is just a beautiful hint to the measurement of the menorahs in the verse itself. The zot and this is the form of the menorah. Now we're going to continue on page 612. And this is just really a really beautiful thing because when you look at the menorah, this is really like the height of symmetry. 
this idea, and I'm holding it up so everyone, everyone can see. This is an example of the menorah. It was made of one piece of gold. Nothing was soldered. It started with one block of gold and it was carved out into this form. Not an easy thing to do, not an easy thing at all. And so it's pointed out that if you count the elements, that's, that's what this chapter is about, the, the significance of measurements. So as we learned, it was 18 hand breaths high, but also it had 22 goblets. Here's three on every, call it arm of the menorah. So three times seven is 21. And there's one more down here, 22. Now, of course, 22 represents the 22 Hebrew letters. Then there were 11 knobs. So here you could see that on the top of these goblets, there is like, it's like a circle. It's not easy to see, but there is like a circle like these. So here you have one, two, three, and there's another one here, four, and these seven. So you had 11. 11 is exactly half of 22. And we know that even though we always talk about the 10 spherot, they're really 11 spherot. Because you, if you count Keter and Dot, you have 11. And you also have, and I believe we learned this, it was a, a while ago, that one of the Kabbalistic alphabets is called Albam. Where, which divides the 22 letters in, in half. 11, meaning Aleph through Lamed. And uh, no, uh, 11 pairs, that's what I want to say. 11 pairs. So the first one goes with the 11th one. The second letter goes with the 12th and so forth. And there's a tradition that God created the world through this alphabet called Albam. And that's where you have an alphabet 11 and 11. And then you have nine flowers. They're very hard to see, but on top of the knobs, there are these like flower-like uh, decorations. And there are nine of them. So you have seven, and then you have one here, eight, and one at the bottom, nine. So that represents the nine vowels. So this goes very, very well with the Talmud in Masechet Brachot that says, how did B'Tzalel know how to really construct the Mishkan other than God told Moshe and Moshe told B'Tzalel, but they wanted on a deeper level. And so they said, because B'Tzalel knew the secrets of the Hebrew letters through which God created the world. And we always talk about the Mishkan as being a microcosm for the macrocosm. So in other words, everything in the Mishkan represents the lower worlds and a corresponding representation with the upper worlds. So here we have 22 goblets, 11 knobs, and nine flowers. And they represent the, the, the letters and the vowels. Now, if you add this up, 22 and 11 and nine, so you get 42. 42 is a very, very significant number. These are the number of stops in the, or camps in the desert. This is the number of words in the very, very Kabbalistic prayer that we say, uh, some people say it every day, 
Some people just on Shabbos is called Ana Bekoach, a very, very Kabbalistic uh, poem that has 42 words. And according to tradition, it corresponds to the 42 letter name of God, which is also involved in the creation. The root word for love, Aleph He Bet, appears 22, 42 times in the five books of Moses. So it's a very significant number. So there are 42 elements to the menorah. But if you count the seven branches, here these are the embellishments of the seven branches. But if you count the branches, then you have 49. And of course, 49 is a very significant number. Those are the days that we count the Omer. That's after seven times seven weeks. And we have Shavuos on the 50th day, seven times seven Shemitah years, 49 years. Then we have the Yovel year, the Jubilee year. So we actually have 49 elements, seven times seven. And if, if you remember the picture I just showed, everything is symmetrical. It's like the secret of symmetry. And seven times seven, of course, is, is really the height of symmetry in, in Jewish tradition. So that's just a very, very beautiful idea. And others add that if you take the whole menorah as one, you have 42 embellishments and the seven branches. But if you take the whole thing as one entity, it's 50, which again are the 50 gates of understanding. So this is all very, very uh, symbolic. OK, we're going to do two more in this chapter, and that is on page 612. So we know that before Avraham is called Avram, he was called Avram. And when he, when God revealed the, the idea of a, of a breach, of a covenant with him, of circumcision, so a, a hey was added to his name. So Avram is Gematria 243, and Avraham is Gematria 248. So the significance of the number of items or the number of, uh, of the Gematria corresponds to what are called the 248 bones in the body and the 248 positive mitzvot. And there's a very uh, significant uh, correspondence between the bones in the body and the positive mitzvah. That's connecting the physical and the spiritual worlds together. But the Gemara asks that before he had the hay, so it said that Avram ruled over only 243 of his bones. Or, or limbs, parts of the body. So they asked, well, in the Gomorrah, in the Darim, they asked, well, when he got the hay, and now he's the full 248, well, what five were added? What five parts of the body did he become master over once he made a covenant with God? And so it, it says, in this Gomorrah, it says his two eyes, his two ears, and the tip of his sexual organ, which is, of course, where the circumcision happens. That until he had circumcision, in the, in the midst of circumcision, he wasn't a total master of that energy. But once he had the hay added to his name and he became Avram, so now he became master and he could rule over all 248 limbs of his body. And the last one is a short one, but an amazing one. On page 613 is that the, the gematria 
of the lost. Oh, Darren asked me to repeat that. So by getting a hey to his name, five, hey equals five, he be became a ruler over five more organs or parts of his body. And so the Gemara says, well, what were the five? Two eyes, two ears, and the tip of his sexual organ, which is where circumcision occurs. That's where the covenant is. So the last one is just a, it's a simple gematria, but it has to do with days. So the Hebrew word for pregnancy is harayon, he resh yud vav nun, which adds up to be 271. And so the sages pointed out that that is the exact amount of days for a full term pregnancy. Nine full months is 271 days. So that's just an amazing connection here between days, 271 days, and the actual gematria of the word that represents the amount of days of pregnancy. Okay, now we're going to chapter 64. And this is numbers in halacha, minhag, and tradition. So here, this is like a, a, a smattering of how halacha, minhag and tradition bases certain ideas based on numbers, either measurements or, or uh, gematria or time or space, different measurements or uh, quantum time. So our first example is page 616. And that is in the famous uh, wrestling match between Yaakov and here we'll call it in the Torah, it says a man. But as we've explained many times, Yaakov is fighting with Esav. He's fighting with himself over his destiny. He's fighting with the angel of Esav. And he's, and he's contending with God all at the same time. This is a whole, whole teaching for those who have Orchard of Delights or my book about dreams that you could see a lot about how he's fighting at all these different levels simultaneously. But it says he, he wrestled with a man. Ve'avek ish imo. He fought with a man. And so the word for, it's literally wrestled. Vaya vek, vav yud aleph bet kuf, equals 119, equals the term kisei hakavod. God's uh, throne of glory his throne of glory. So what, are, what do the two have to do with each other? What does wrestling have to do with the throne of glory? If you look at the root word of wrestling, it's aleph bet kuf, which means dust, avak, dust. So, they, so the tradition says that when they were wrestling, the dust, created by the wrestling, rose to the Kisei HaKavod. So you'll say, well, where did they get that idea? But here we see it's from the Gematria that these two words equal each other. And so therefore, there's this tradition that the dust rose all the ways up to the Kisei HaKavod. So then we'll ask, well, what, what does that mean? So here we could just answer simply that this, this wrestling match is what produced Yaakov's name being changed from Yaakov to Yisrael. His whole identity is 
changed because he's given a new name and a new name always represents a new identity. So this is one of the most archetypal incidences in the Torah. This wrestling match between Yaakov and himself, Esav, his fate, his destiny, uh, the angel of Esav, which we'll learn about in another minute, and God himself. Because at the end, when he names the, the name of the place, he called it Pniel, which means the face of God. And Yaakov me, says, I have seen the face of God, and I, 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 I'm living to tell the story. And of course, the name Yisrael means you have contended with man and God, and you have prevailed. That's what the name Yisrael means. Kisarita im alashim ve'elokim ve'tukal. You fought with actually God and man, and you prevailed. So here, this is as archetypal as you can get. So that's what it means in tradition. The idea that the dust from the wrestling rose up to the Kisei Akavod. Now the next one is on 617. And this is Birchat Kohanim. Birchat Kohanim is also very, very symmetrical. There are three verses in Birchat Kohanim. The first verse has 15, has, has three words. The second verse has five words, and the third verse has seven words. The first verse has 15 letters, the second verse has 20 letters, and the third verse has 25 letters. So it's very, it's, it, I'm going to show you, it's like a triangle. You can see it's like built like a triangle. Three, five, and seven words, 15, 20, and 25 letters. So we know that Birchat Kohanim is, the, the Kohen does it with his hands. I can't, I can't separate my fingers. <laughs> Some people can, I can't. But Kohanim are supposed to be able to do it naturally. I cannot. My wife is a bot coin and she can do it. <laughs> I can't. Ah, Toby just did it. <laughs> I can't do it. But underneath their talus, they are blessing the people with their hands. And it's very, very significant, the role of the hands in Birchat Kohanim. And so the sages explain, uh, it's actually in the Mishnah, the Mishnah of Oalot, that there are 30 bones in the hand. They count 30 different bones in the different joints of the hand. But when you put the two hands together, 30 and 30, you have 60. That's the amount of letters in Birchat Koni, are 60 letters. And if you look at my hand for a second, there are 15 parts of the hand. Each finger has three parts. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. You can see the lines of the joints. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. The exception, of course, is the thumb. Only has two. So that's 13, 14. And then the palm itself, is the 15th element of the hand. That's exactly how many words in Birchat Kohanim. So the, the 15 words of Birchat Kohanim is in a sense the, the segments of a hand and the 60 letters are the two hands stretched out giving the blessing, the 60 bones in both hands. So this is, again, this is just a, a, an amazing connection 
between words, letters, and uh, Toby, can you wait? Because I can't, un I can't un 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 um, unmute you right now. Sorry. <laughs> we'll get to it, okay? Okay. Okay, that's the next example. Now, the next one is actually an amazing thing. We learned a halacha from an extra letter in a word. So it says in Exodus 22:30, Shemot, 22nd chapter, 30 verse, it says, and you shall be a holy people to me. Flesh torn in the field, which we call a trefa, literally ripped. Flesh torn in the field, you shall not eat. You shall throw it to the dogs. Meaning, it's not forbidden to get some use out of it. You just can't eat it. So the word for you shall throw in the Torah is tashlichun. It means to throw, tashlichun. But it's pointed out, the sages notice that the nun at the end of the word is not really needed to get the point across. The verb to throw is tashlichu, and you shall throw. And the nun at the end is like, hmm, what is it doing there? So the sages, if you remember, going back maybe six months ago, we had a whole chapter about when there are extra letters in a word, it means we learn something from them. So here, the letter nun equals 50. So the sages learn a halacha that um, if someone finds a carcass in the city, in a city, they have to take it at least 50 cubits, 50 amas. An ama is from the um, elbow to the tip of the, of the finger. This is a cubit. It's anywhere from 18 to 24 inches, depending on the commentary. So they, the halacha is, because of this extra letter nun, that is, it's, it's a halacha. In other words, if you find a carcass in your yard, you can't just take it and throw it in the public domain. You would have, I mean, in those days, they, they didn't have um, um, trash trucks coming around. Someone would have to take it 50 cubits outside of the city. Why? Is because the carcass smells. And so this is one of, of scores of examples of environmental issues that are dealt with in halacha. And this is what we would call uh, uh, smell pollution, that they actually legislated about smell pollution. And that's why, let's say, a tanner, there are certain halachas of how how far he had to be away from any neighbor because of the smell of a, of a tanner. So this we learned because of an extra nun. But the important thing is that the nun equals 50. And so they learned it has to be 50 cubits outside of the city. The next one is with, with tzitzit, that I'm trying to show an example here. Okay, so here, I don't know if you can see, these are my tzitzit. And there are, let me see, this is my white shirt, it's not showing so good. Anyways, there are six winds of the strand and then a knot. And then seven winds of the strand and a knot and then 11 strands and a knot, and then 13 and a knot. This is maybe the most common way. It's not the only way. There are other traditions 
of how one does the wraps the one strand around the other seven. There are eight strands all together. You can see them, there are eight strands. And there are four corners. So there's 32 strands all together. But this is, I'd say probably the most common is seven, eight, 11, and 13 winds around. So that adds up to 39. And 39 equals Hashem Echad. And so this was definitely one of the kavanas of having, of course, 7, 8, 11, and 13, all in their way are very significant numbers. They all have lots of symbolism. We're not going to go into that right now. But it equals Hashem Echad. And it turns out that when we say what's called the, the, the passage about seat seat, we say it in, in the morning and in the evening. But it's the third passage of the Shema. And how do we end the Shema? Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. So here it's connecting the, the verse of Shema to the fact that the third passage that we're reading is about the tzitzit. And so the number of strands, again, 7, 8, 11, and 13 equal 39, equals Hashem Echad. Now, I mentioned that there's eight strands on each corner. So 8 times 4, of course, is 32, which spells Lev. And in the first verse after the Shema, we say, And you shall love God, your God, with all your heart. So this connects the Shema with the, the actual measurement, the numbers of strands and how many times uh, they are winded around. It, it, it makes a synergy. Uh, between the Shema and the passage of Tzitzit. Now the next one I'm going to mention in, in short. And for those who come to the Tuesday class, not this Tuesday, but next Tuesday, we're going to learn uh, in some depth about the, the ritual of Tashlich. Tashlich is a very special ritual that we do on Rosh Hashanah even though you can do it up to Yom Kippur. But the tradition is to try to do it on Rosh Hashanah, if you can. Not everyone can get to a place of flowing water. The best place is by a flowing stream. But it can be, it could be a lake, it could be a pond, it could be the ocean, it could be a uh, sea. But they say the best if, if, if it's flowing because we symbolically get rid of our, our sins. So the question is asked, well, why by water? So that's, I'm not gonna get into it because it, it, there's so many different symbolisms of why by water. For those who will be with us two weeks from now on Tuesday, we'll delve into that. But I wanna just make a simple connection um, according to tradition, you don't just throw your sins out the window. It should be by a body of water. So the question is, is asked, well, why by a body of water? One of the many answers is that on Rosh Hashanah, we are coronating God, King of the universe. If you look at the prayers of Rosh Hashanah, it's more about coronating God king than the whole idea of judgment and tshuva. I'm just saying in, in the actual uh, text of the prayers, the emphasis is, is really on this idea of making God king, acknowledging God as king. And so we have an amazing connection here, is that the, the gematria, of water is 90, mine. 
before I go on, I, I, I needed to add something else. And, and, and one of the reasons, so how is this connected to making God king? So it, there's a tradition that a king is coronated, a, a king of, of flesh and blood, a Jewish king is coronated by a body of water. And what's the significance, especially, there was a special place actually, um, what's called Ir David. Today we call it the city of David. And there was a flowing stream called the May Shiloach. Many people have heard of the Hasidic <coughs> commentary called the May Shiloach. Well, that was a real stream. That was one, it was the, the water source of Jerusalem. And a king would be coordinated there. And so what's, this, what's the symbolism? Is just like water flows that the, <clears throat> the uh, kingship of the king should flow onto his children and their children and their children. And that's why all the legitimate kings of Israel <clears throat> were from David. Once David became king, then the kings of Israel were supposed to be in the line of David. So the, I'll go back now, the gematria for the word for water, mayim, 40, 10, and 40, mem, yud, mem, equals exactly melech. Melech equals 90. So here we can see why they came up with this tradition. One of the secrets is that it's by, the king is coordinated by a body of water. And today, where we don't have a king, but we have the king of the universe. So for Tashli, we go to a body of water as a continuation of our prayers on Rosh Hashanah to coronate God as king. Now, the last one we're going to do before we get to the, the last chapter for tonight is on page 622. This is also an amazing one. It says in the Mishnah that who, who is um, able to take charity from public funds? They had rules. And so the description is, is that a poor person, if he has 200 zoos, he is not considered a poor person anymore and he cannot take from the public uh, kitty. If he has less than 200 zoos, he can. So here we're gonna, we have like a double uh, symbolism here um, of, of measurement and halacha. This is a halacha. So the one of the words for being poor is rash, which is the same as resh. The letter resh is resh yud shin, and a poor person is resh shin. The, the, one of the meanings, there's many meanings, but one of the meanings of the letter Reish signifies a poor person. So the gematria of Reish equals 200. So this is a connection. How did they come up with 200 zoos? Why not 210 zoos? Because the definition of a poor person is based on the letter Reish, and Reish equals 200. So they made these connections. But the amazing thing on top of this is that the word for charity that we use all the time, tzedakah, equals 199. The word tzedakah equals 199. And so therefore, if someone has only 199 zoos, he, he or she qualifies for public tzedakah. But if they have 200, then they're no longer called a poor person and they can't take from the public. 
coffers. Okay, the last chapter we're doing tonight are numbers and time. The connection of numbers with time. So the first one we're going to do is on page 623. And when we talked about the menorah, we mentioned that the number seven and also in the, the strands of the tzitzit is, of course, one of the most significant of all numbers. But what's interesting is that there are seven cycles of time based on the number seven. I'll go through them quickly. There's seven days of the week. Six days you work, and the seventh day you rest is Shabbos. So the, the, the cycle of time that we base our lives around, really, is based on seven. So we have seven as it relates to days, seven days. Then we have the cycle of the year called the seven weeks. That's when we're counting the Omer. We count seven days times seven weeks between the second day of Pesach, and then we celebrate Shavuos on the 50th day. So we have a cycle of seven relating now to weeks. The one that is least known is the seven month cycle. And that is that the three pilgrimage holidays equal, um, excuse me, the three e pilgrimage holidays all occur in the first seven months of the year. Pesach is in Nisan, the first of the months, and Shavuos is in the third month, and Sukkot is in the seventh month. They all occur in the first seven months, and this actually has significance uh, relating to making oaths and returning lost objects. That the, the pilgrimage cycle of seven months has halachic uh, significance. Then that, so that's three different cycles. We have days, weeks, months, now years. Of course, this year is a Shemitah year. Six, day, six years you work your fields. In the seventh year, you rest your fields. So now we have a cycle of seven with years. Then you have seven times seven years. And you have the Yovel, the Jubilee year. This is a whole cycle of time. Seven times seven, then the Jubilee. So that's five cycles. Then we have, according to tradition, that this cycle of history will last 6,000 years. And then the 7,000th is the time of Mashiach. Just like there's six days of the week and we rest on the seventh, we're told there'll be 6,000 years of this cycle of history, this level of, of human consciousness. And then will be the Messianic era, or sometimes we refer to it as Yom Shekulo Shabbos, a day that is all Shabbat. So that's now six segments of time based on seven. And the last one is a very mystical, symbolic idea of 49,000 Yovel years, that this is connected to the world to come. And this represents like an infinite number, 49,000 Yovels, Jubilee years. And that's symbolic of like an infinite, eternal state of consciousness. So, though, so that's just amazing that, that all of our cycles of time are connected to seven based on the first one. Six days, God created the world. And the seventh was when, when God rested. Our next one is, we mentioned uh, already the angel of Esau. According to tradition, the angel of Esau is Satan, is Satan. And so it's pointed out sometimes it's, he's referred to Hasatan, the Satan. And so the gematria of 
Hasatan is 264. So the Gemara, this is on, on page 628, that the Gemara is 264. And so the Gemara in the Darim, the sages point out there are 365 days of a solar year. And even though we have a lunar calendar, we know that seven times in every 19 years, we have a leap month in order that the lunar and solar calendars should be in sync one with the other. So even though we're a lunar calendar, the, the solar cam calendar also has a lot of significance. So the gematria, so the, the, the sages point, point out, well, has, has Satan is 264 and there are 365 days. So it says, along with being called Satan, sometimes it's called, it's the same energy, the nachash, the snake, or the other side, or the Yetzirah. These are all, in a sense, uh, interchangeable terms for the same kind of energy. So they point out that the Satan or the Yetzirah is in full force 364 days a year. So what's the exception? Yom Kippur. They say Yom Kippur is we have a fighting chance against the Yetzirah because of the intrinsic holiness of the day. So that's, uh, and also, if you know, before we blow the shofar, um, we, we read a, a number of verses, and the, the acronym is Kra Satan. Rip up the Satan. So also the shofar blowing, that's the, the first of the 10 days of tshuva, which culminates in Yom Kippur, is this idea of we, if we really work hard at it, we can overcome the Yetzirah. The next one is very, very connected to uh, the, the time period we're about to come up with. And that is between Rosh Hashanah and, and Simchas Torah, there are 22 days. In Chutz Laaretz, Simchas Torah is the 23rd day because uh, Shmini Yitzaret and Simchas Torah are considered like two, two days. In Eretz Yisrael, it's the same day. So in, all the holidays really follow their observance in the land of Israel. So there are 22 days. Now, obviously this connects to the 22 Hebrew letters from Aleph Ad Taf. And therefore we could symbolically, we can see, even though we say the whole year is judged on Rosh Hashanah, but we know that it's, it's really the beginning of the judgment and for most people, it's held in abeyance until Yom Kippur. And even though in the Ela we make what's called the final sealing, we're told it's not really the final sealing. That only occurs on Hoshana Rabbah. So we see that even though the seed of the whole year is in Rosh Hashanah, but that seed really from Rosh Hashanah through Simchas Torah is like one long day. And in fact, only in Eretz Yisrael do we have a two-day holiday, and that's Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is a, a two-dayer everywhere, whereas the first days of Pesach and the last days of Pesach are only two days in Chutz Laaretz. And so the... the the term used for the two days is Yom Richta. It's really like one long day. Arichta means long. But really from Rosh Hashanah through Simchas Torah is like one long day. 
Now there is one other cycle of time in the year that also is 22 days. And that is from Yud Zayin B'Tammuz through Tisha B'Av. In other words, what we call the three weeks is really 22 days. T Tisha B'Av is actually the 22nd day. So the Slonimer Rebbe points something out very, very important. And he says it's, it, 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 it's not a coincidence that you have two cycles of 22 days and they're not that far um, uh, apart from each other. So he says like this, he gives a, a, a metaphor. He says, when someone is drawing a picture, so first they will draw the outline and then they will color it in. So he says that the three weeks is when we're drawing the outline of the new year. And we color it in between Rosh Hashanah and Simchas Torah. It's a very, very beautiful metaphor. I don't have time to go into it, but there's so many connections between the month of Av and the month of Tishrei. Av Elul Tishrei. It's like a flow. And it even it basically even starts in Tammuz. There's, there's a flow from the breaking of the tablets of the law by Moshe and Yud Zayin Tammuz until Yom Kippur, when he comes, when Moshe comes down with the second set of tablets. So again, this, this whole chapter 65 is about the connection of numbers to time, different segments of, of time. Okay, I think that's a good place to stop. That will give us time to have, uh, to have discussion. We'll end with a, a blessing that we, we are all able to color in our picture of the new year in beautiful colors, healthy colors, um, colors that bring us great joy. And it should be a, a beautiful, healthy, happy year for all of us.